Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, <laughs> I have to say I'm very nervous, just to let you know. Um, welcome, and I'm very happy to be here to present my research, which is very close to my heart. Um, the topic is about NFT, beyond the hype, how token economy impacts creative entrepreneurship. And just a disclaimer, I'm not here to shield any NFT project or whatsoever for me. The topic I'm very fascinated, which is why I dedicated my time to do an academic um, research about this to give the whole new phenomenon a different aspect towards it. This image here is the most expensive board ape sold for US dollar 3.4 million um, at Sotheby's auction, October 2021. And for me, it was like how, why, and what? I mean, first of all, who creates something like this? Whether it's beautiful or not, it's always in the eye of the beholder, but why are people creating? And another question that went to my mind was like, um, who's paying like this amount of sum? And as a curious person I am, if I see something, I always want to figure out more about it. Um, I want to do a research, I want to dig into the topic, because the media is just portraying the numbers and figures, but I think it's more sub, uh, context towards it, and I really am passionate about um, giving a little bit um, context to the whole phenomenon. This is basically the why I decided to do um, this study. Um, it happened during my second master in computer science slash, uh, information system. I started two years ago. Um, it was in summer 2021 when I did like summer school from University of Zurich deep dive into blockchain, I was very fascinated by the topic, and I attended many hackathons, and I um, read many papers about it. The area of my research is more about token economy. I mean, blockchain space is very broad, but I just focus on one aspect of it. And the question I want to answer is, how does this new phenomenon impact the creative entrepreneurs, and how do they harness uh, token economy in their creative um, entrepreneurship? Because most research that I found was mainly focused on the technical aspect of the NFT schema or the risk, etc., but not really on those who are creating NFTs. I mean, personal motivation is one aspect of it, but I think in order to do from an academic perspective, the next question I ask myself, is my topic relevant? Does it add any value? Has, um, is, are people even interested? And I say, I could answer the question, yes, because the research at the intersection of technology, creative economy, society, and it links the creation between the value that NFT enables towards um, those who are creating NFTs. And I think, since it's a new phenomenon, not much research has been about this topic. I mean, I cannot go like there's a research of 20 years or 10 years, which is why I think it's very original and new. And the objective of my research is definitely purely from a creator's perspective. I want to gain their insights, knowledge, feelings, what moves them, what kind of impact does it have? Is it positive or negative? So that's mainly, in a nutshell, the area of my research that um, I um, focus on. The NFT ecosystem is very broad. Um, you have like two-sided marketplace, those who create NFTs, can be artists, game developer, producers, painters, um, etc. And the other side are collectors, and the collectors can be divided roughly in fans. I consider myself as a fan. I have deep emotion connection to my NFTs, the crypto coven that I have, even though I have many people um, give a high bid price to buy it, but it looks like me. It has my um, hair color that I'm currently wearing now. For me, it feels like um, digital twin that I have, so for me, I could not never sell it for no amount of money. And the other aspect of um, collectors are the flippers, those who are flipping JPEGs left and right. I think this is mainly people who are making a lot like profit, and this is what portrayed in the media. And I think this is why maybe it, NFT can have like a negative. How should I say? Negative feeling to, um, when people hear about it. But I personally think. There's more to it, and that's why I just take a step back, put the creators into focus, and give them a space to share their insight, because this is it left out in the media. And um, before 
we can even grab or make a comment um, about it. It's, it's always good to, to, um, to have like um, holistic conceptual views of the whole ecosystem. The first part of my review uh, um, study was like, I had to define what is creativity. There's, according to scholars, creativity can be defined as something that is novel, something that is perceived as useful, and something that is also unique. And then the next step was the creative entrepreneurs are considered individuals who are operating in the creative economy. And new technologies like blockchain, AI, etc., this can enable those who are working in the creative economy to um, create new digital offerings and new business ventures. And creative economy is defined as anything that involves human creativity, technology, and ideas. And it's heavily impacted by AI, VR, as well, um, as well as blockchain technology. The second aspect of my um, research was like the technical aspect, putting blockchain in NFT in the, in, uh, into context. The first layer is like a blockchain layer, and on top of it are smart contract. And then token economy itself is it's a broad, um, um, broad uh, topic. You can have voting token, consensus token, work token, equity token, etc. And then asset token is one aspect of it. The NFT is an application of the asset token. Um, that's what, where my research focuses on. So it's, that's why it's, it's very broad, but I just want to narrow it down to people see that, hey, it's NFT, asset token, and within this NFT, I only focus on the creator's perspective. Now we had the why, and now I say how. How did I arrive to my findings? How did I, what was the procedure that I applied in order to answer the research question? In research, you can do like basically two strings. You can do qualitative or quantitative. I decided to do qualitative mainly of two reasons. First of all, it's a new phenomenon, which means I do not have a massive amount of sample size that enables me to do a qualitative um, um, review by doing um, review of like maybe 2,000 or um, more sample size, and also of, um, it does not enable me to have a do research of many decades or many years, which is why qualitative is suitable for something that is new, especially something that I want to gain insights, feelings, and, um, and knowledge of those who are involved. The participant, I conducted up to now 20 plus uh, participants from all over the world, from some are based in Europe, Middle East, South America, Africa, and Asia. The time frame, I started last August. I submitted my thesis um, in November, but I'm so fascinated. As I said, it's something close to my heart. I'm doing it on an ongoing basis. I'm still collecting more and more interviews. The duration of the interviews lasted like an hour. The now uh, it's just that the recorded time that I took um, recorded speech that I need to transcribe, and an hour transcribed material are uh, like 20 pages of material that I went through, read it, and um, tried to cluster it. The, during the interview process, I mean it was very funny, but every time I thought uh, I don't gain anything new, someone always shared a new aspect, brought me to a new angle. Some conversations were highly philosophical. I could have gone on and talked like maybe for three additional hours. And most of the participants were, how should I say, at the beginning very hesitant, but then as, as the conversation goes on, they were very open, they shared many of their feelings, positive and negative ideas. It was. The, te the technique that I used was, um, it's called semi-structured. What does it mean? It means that the questionnaire, I had it with myself, but I did not share it with the participant. The reason why I didn't do this is when you share the question beforehand, they usually just stick to the questions and they don't open up as much as they could, but I just had it for myself as a guidance. And when someone started talking about A, and he ended up talking about a topic, I mean, for example, I'm a football fan, and when we talk about football, but it's nice, but it doesn't really add value to answer my research question, then I had to nudge them back into to the, to the question. But other than that, I just really let them talk freely. Some had took longer breaks, answering questions, etc. Um, I was really fascinated, loved hearing their stories. 
Some of the participants were a little bit tight-lipped, but it was mainly because of a language barrier. I did the interviews in English, and some of them were not native speaking English. So if you don't speak in your native language, it limits you in expressing yourself freely and more, um, limits you share more, um, less emotions. But I had to do this because I have to transcribe it in, the language needs to be the same in order to cross-validate the, the, the interview material. Yes, so mainly, I mean, what, what, what I mean by storytelling is that for me it's important to answer research question that people are able to have like a drama to be. They start maybe very, um, like the, in, very formal, but then they become like very emotional, and then um, I just, I did not really want to put them into a box, the questions they want to answer. So I answered the, the structure of the question, I just let them de de um, decide. Sometimes when I realized that he was already talking about his procedure and what inspired him, maybe I had it in the third section, but I let, let always let people freely talk and so capture as much and as beautiful storytelling as possible. These are the findings. Um, the journey, the, this image here describes mainly the journey of a creator. I start with a purpose. The purpose could be anything that led them in creating NFT. It could be just to enrich themselves. You can have economic purpose in doing something. It could also be we were fast some well, game developers before, and creating NFT uh, gaming was just like a, um, a logical step towards the, the path that they've already chosen. So they were fascinated because of the technological uh, trajectory. Others were fascinated because of the decentralized aspect. So it it, it corresponds with the ide ideological uh, being. And others were maybe fascinated because of uh, it enables them or the artistic, um, the artistic um, outcome of other NFT creators sparked them in doing NFTs. Time, um, the category time relates anything about the frequency of, uh, of doing something, the frequency of selling NFTs or creation process. And I have to mention that all the participants were creators before. So it means that they have done um, artistic work before the NFT came, so it had impact on how they were able to um, express their creative um, identity. For example, if you do murals, or if you do painting, if you do spraying on a wall, it needs time to dry the painting before you are able to exhibit. But with this new technology, it has changed the way they're able to express their creative identity. And also, like time related to when they do community engagement. Other people, some creators do frequent engagement, others maybe once off. That's related to time. Space, it's, it's related to how does the technical space enable participants to do something? Are they limited in the creative expression? Um, or is it something that gives them freedom to explore things which was within them, but in the traditional artwork, it w they were not exposed to or didn't have the, the, the means toward it because they were highly put into a box in, in doing certain things because maybe a gallery told them how to do this or a record label is doing this. So that's related to space. And space could also be, for example, economic space all aspects of the different NFT platform, like for example, non-origin, OpenSea, Rarible, etc. These are all economic uh, platforms that also impact how they can sell, what kind of commission they need to um, share, what kind of um, other requirements are there in order for, they need to overcome in order to participate on these platforms. On top of it, you see the actors. Actors are other people, either individuals or groups within the ecosystem. You can re mainly refer to these actors as also maybe as some sort of gatekeepers. Maybe it also are the influential people who can have control over how successful the NFT project is going to be sold. Actors could also be community engagement and all the other creators. Sometimes um, some creators were influenced or um, their success is also impacted by other creators. 
And then events, for example, the last one is differs from time in the sense that was there any significant event that happened that impacted their creative entrepreneurship? And some said that since they've been invited to speak at NFT NYC, it had a tremendous impact over their artistic, um, artistic life. And compared to traditional um, artwork that they were not exposed to it or for example, I mean, if our Basel is a very prestigious place where, as a, any creator, if you want to exhibit your artwork there, once you have been invited, I think it sets you on a different pedestal or a different um, environment. But not many artists are able to showcase their, their artwork at our Basel. But for example, but if you have opportunity to attend NFT NYC or NFT London, etc. that also opens up doors. And this is um, the category event is related to anything that significantly happened throughout the whole um, our creators' um, entrepreneurship. Now, I've, uh, this is the first finding. The first one I can share is like collaborative economy. What do I mean by this? It's, it has a change in the way creators can monetize the artwork. They have control over it. It's like more a participative, collaborative economy. It's more a togetherness rather than superior, inferior, like a gallery is dictating you as a creator what you, what you should paint and where you can exhibit. It has definitely increased the efficiency in monetizing the artwork, and especially for underrepresented creators, it has increased the opportunity to be part of it. It, it of all of a sudden, it's like you sit, because the internet is borderless, wherever you sit, wherever you are, as long as you have access to it, it enables you to participate and, and being part of an of, of a, of a economy, which in the traditional world, they have been left out before. The second finding that I definitely have is um, there's a shift in artistic value creation, shift in control or promotion of the artwork, and also uh, freedom in exploring different revenue models. You're not just bound to one source. You can have the opportunity of having many sources. And the f interesting thing is, even after the pandemic, I think the pandemic also let them be um, like had influence of selling your artwork online. But even after the pandemic, where they were able to go back to the traditional artwork, almost all participants said that they will stick being in the space, being an NFT creator. Um, it, it just enables them not put all the eggs in one basket, but to spread the risk of uh, on having different revenue streams. And that sets, gives them a little bit more freedom of not always hustling that, hey, you need to sell at uh, this place. And, and yeah, it just gives them, it, it's a paradigm shift in how they, they want to, um, they can create artistic value. The third finding that I can share is the creation process, really most all participants said that they have the freedom in exploring, in, in, in expressing themselves, and the freedom, it, they cannot compare as before. It's just like they are not limited to the medium that they have. They're not limited to gatekeepers. And they were even, especially those who were musicians before, they said that because of like a music NFT, you can create like a simple set of maybe 100 or 500 sets. And they were able to experiment music genre, which I think they wouldn't have done it if it was like uh, if, if the record label was promoting and telling them what they have to do. And it also gives them um, freedom to, to it, it, uh, it, uh, it has awakened um, an artistic side, a creation process, a creativity that they didn't know they even had it before. And uh, NFT is like, it's an interactive media where you can have audio and visual elements. So it's something that um, they find it very fascinating. And yes, the creation process really has um, uh, impacted and shifted a lot. The fourth finding is that it uh, really comes to community engagement. And this is something funny that it was, decentralization comes with 
freedom, but this freedom has also a cost. Freedom in the sense of it has it changed artists' life. Before they were just creating, and then someone did a promotion, someone sell it, but now all of a sudden they had to do the whole value chain of creating, promoting, doing engagement. And those creators who are more on the introvert side, they they were completely overwhelmed. Like, what is this girl? Like what it treated way, they were really, really um, <laughs> overwhelmed and <laughs> like they, they, they were afraid of doing it, but I think the pandemic helped them to adjust because all of a sudden they were forced to engage with people online. And I don't, they, Mani said that they were funny that I, the pandemic helped them. They didn't know they, if they would have had such an online presence if it wasn't for the pandemic. So it is something that, it, it's like it, they were just forced into it. It was really funny to hear that story. Others really embraced. They said that, oh, even though I have to do the own uh, community engagement, but I can decide when I want to do engagement. I can decide on the medium. I, some only do engagement on Instagram, others on Discord. And this gives them also freedom in doing the engagement when and how and, and in, in which medium. That's what also they cherish most about it. It also gives increased transparency on the sale proceeds, how it's going to be used. Some creators said that I think 75% of the proceeds is going to the community. The community can decide how they want to invest the money in doing education for other creators or helping other musicians um, on their own, on becoming um, creators itself. So it's something that they really cherish about it. And also gives like it's for some sort of um, Community members have participated in co-creation. Um, maybe it's like a creator said that, hey, which NFTs do you like? And they also take source and, um, of, of inspiration from the community engagement in what kind of new NFTs they want to create. So it's a um, collaborative, um, participative creation. And the fifth findings is definitely it's challenging. If you're tech novice, some creators are purely artistic human beings. I mean, they struggle in even writing an email. I, it, I was, it was so challenging. I could figure out those who are tech novice also struggled in <laughs> like correspond to my emails when I or even stick to the to the the, the, um, the Zoom call that the the. the the time that we have scheduled. I think there's a high correlation if you're a little bit purely artistic, dreaming in your own world, versus um, and, and those who are not tech novice, but I would say tech expert. And this is was this was um, also related to the whole minting process. This was a huge challenge, and it was a huge awakening call. If if you never dealt with anything um, tech stack aspect about it, but however. It was challenging for them. They really, um, yeah, they just learn and embrace it. And some have been scammed, but this, I think it's part of the learning process. Um, challenge, another challenge that they said that it really impacted their artist's life to a way it was not foreseeable. They couldn't have imagined it. And it also leads to, I mean, it's a new phenomenon. It, it's, it's, everything is new. The documentation is not very good in to some as like um, platforms and uh, etc. And this also impacted in the whole being. And yes, these are mainly how should I say the challenges that um, they need to overcome. And I think it would be interesting to see if I'm doing this research, like maybe in two years now, because this is the first NFT wave. Maybe in the second NFT wave, we'll would be interested to see. Even if I do the same participant, interviewing the same participant or others, what kind, if the challenges that are here now, if they have changed or new challenges will come. This is something that I personally find it interesting to see uh, in two or three years uh, from now. Okay, um, these are the findings I show. I, now I want to show how did I arrive to the findings. When I talk about coding, I'm not mean software coding like writing a Python code, but it's more about coding, as assigning, it's looking at the text and assigning a, a team, a cluster towards it. And this is a very highly tedious work that you have to go back and forth when, I mean, I did, do, I did it without AI, so, <laughs> so I did it myself that I transcribed the text, 
um, then I read through it and I said, okay, where, how does it come? What kind of codes, um, clusters can I form? And I like did three interviews and then I started to do like preliminary coding and then I did additional interviews and then it's like, like I did like a zigzag back and forth procedure until I arrived to the final coding. Um, it looks like this. On the left side, I have the raw data. This is like a code from the participant. Then I assign the preliminary code. For example, I would say that it's related to purpose or mechanism. And then the final code, um, as mentioned before, the purpose can be fine granular divided into, oh, what's the identification with the technological trajectory or mechanism? But what does it mean? Is it a creation process mechanism or a selling mechanism? That's mainly the process that I apply to arrive in the coding category. And these are the six coding categories I mentioned before, purpose, time, space, procedures, access, and events, and the subcategories that I have applied to the whole um, interview material. Yes, so that's mainly how it is for me. It's like I personally think it's, it's more than technology. It's, it's finance, governance, collaboration, it's culture. It's, it's such an immersive environment, sometimes very philosophical, political, and to me, very, very much enriching. I hope you enjoyed listening. That's it. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Abdan, for an amazing talk. Uh, if we have any questions in the audience for Abna, feel free to raise your hand and we'll uh, forward the microphone to you. Yes, yeah. microphone here, please. Hey, that was a great presentation, thank you. Um, thank I'm curious, you. like one thing I, I saw when, you know, NFTs kind of exploded is kind of increased competition, right? There's a lot more actors involved. Um, how do you feel that uh, discussion went? Did anyone have this feeling of like, oh, maybe it's a little bit more difficult to uh, achieve a higher you know, quality in the art world in NFT? Uh, whereas if they kept doing what they were more comfortable with, that they feel that they've already kind of had this traction, right? Um, and did you get any kind of feeling like that from your interviews? So I didn't hear you from uh, acoustic point. Sorry, <laughs> can you try 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 standing here? Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's the acoustics. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Maybe that's better. Okay, so uh, I'm interested in like you know the NFT when NFTs kind of exploded. There was lots of people trying to get into the space, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of artists uh, were kind of competing. And I'm wondering, like in your conversations you had, is if you got a sense of that, like were people feeling that it was very difficult space to break into? Um, and were they, you know, a little hesitant to do that because uh, of that competition? Thank you. Um, interesting question. It, it, the competition was, I could definitely feel it. And especially, because I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a first wave of NFT and sometimes the, um, the quality of the NFTs were not really... Successful NFT projects does not mean high quality. And this is something that throughout all the inter participants, they said that, yeah, it is, um, they could feel. And, and some NF, like some... Um, the, the, the ecosystem, I think, it can be very brutal in the in, in the sense of um, gatekeepers are, are left out, but influencers are like the hidden, how should they, kingmakers or queenmakers, and they, they have um, it, it, it is a it is a competitive market, and to break it in to be recognized, it is challenging. But I think it, it, it goes hand in hand. The art world itself is challenging to be recognized because art is, I think, it's not something that you can measure, like quantify in, in, in numbers. And anything that you cannot quantify in numbers, it is very subjective. And, uh, not, and, and, and especially something that's beautiful. And I think it, the technology itself did not erase this problem. It has just 
weaken the problem, but, but it, uh, the challenges of, of the art world itself, it remains. But I think you have the chance in being uh, increased visibility by doing community engagement. This is something that nobody can take it away from you. So the entry barrier is there, but it, the barrier has lowered, definitely. Is I any... hope that answers your question. Does it answer your question? Sorry. <laughs> It, yes, another question over there. Oh, thank you. Um, um, can we, thanks, um, thanks for the chat, Lena. Um, uh, so my question is, oh, it's, it's louder now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I, I find your perception on NFTs very fascinating and insightful. I wonder if there's a NFT project that you have in mind that you admire and why? Hmm. <laughs> Good question. I think Crypto Coven um, is a, it's a project that I admire for two reasons. First of all, it was a birthday gift that I received a couple of, um, like, two years ago. And the other aspect, that's why it's very uh, personal, and the other aspect I admire is it is a PFP project, and being as a black woman, I had, there was a, a huge variety of different covens, and someone, a uh, coven looked like me. So it's a sense of inclusivity and, and belonging that I did not experience with other projects, and also like, on, like um, in, in the fashion um, world, etc. So that's why I really admire the thought of representation. Someone is thinking about, hey, there are people who, look like this, have a skin color, and, and when you see a digital twin of yourself that you can carry along with, it's, it, um, yeah, that's, that's really close to my heart. I think that's why I really love Crypto Coven, <laughs> for that aspect of, um, yeah, thinking a step ahead and creating a space where you find your digital twin. <laughs> Once again, Abna, thank you so much for coming to Belgrade <laughs> and giving us a start. <laughs>